oceans cover three quarters of the planet. But it's very difficult to see beneath the sea. We haven't been able to understand where the highly migratory species go. The bluefins, the sharks. These are the animals that are really important to the ecosystems in the ocean. So to better understand where they go and to understand the spatial use of habitat that's required to protect them, we really need to figure out how to follow them beneath the sea. Here in Monterey Bay, we have one of the most amazing national marine sanctuaries in the United States. It's a place that's bigger than Yellowstone and Yosemite, and it has ecosystems as vibrant as Yellowstone. And instead of bisons and wolves, we've got white sharks and the largest mammals on the planet, the blue whales, the humpbacks, bluefin tuna, and a variety of other mammals such as otters and sea lions. We've got this coastal upwelling that's serving up nutrients and anchovy, and all of that then creates a restaurant for all of those animals to gather calories for a short period of time. It's one of the richest biological places on the planet. One of the great aspects of working in Monterey Bay is we can wake up in our house, get on a boat that's an hour away, go out to Año Nuevo, one of the most beautiful reserves we have here, and we can actually work on white sharks. Yeah, we've got the Top Shot camera. I'm going. Uh, so we just got here, just in front of the amphitheater, and we have a shark just swimming towards our bag lady decoy just now. We're running a bait and switch. We have a scent on the boat that attracts the shark. It's a piece of whale, a small piece of elephant seal. We then have a decoy that's cut out in the shape of an elephant seal or a sea lion. And so what we're trying to do is attract a shark in to the boat and then have them pick up the decoy that's out on a fishing line. And our favorite work is to just pull that shark close to the boat, at which point we photo ID it, get its gender, put in a tag, and take a biopsy for DNA. So the challenging thing about white sharks is they're really big, and also they're gill breathers. So they're like, they're a fish. They're not a marine mammal. Marine mammals come up to the surface to breathe, so they're a lot easier to find. White sharks don't need to come up to the surface, so we need to use unique technologies to find them, to record their presence, to track their movements. When we see the sharks at these aggregation sites, there's just one point in time. To know what they're doing when they're away from the coast, when they're at depths that humans can't go, we need to deploy tags in order to track their behaviours. This is a pop-up satellite archival tag, and today we're going to try to put it on a white shark. When these go on a white shark, we get up to a year of its track, and this shark today might go all the way to the White Shark Cafe and come back, and how we get that data is amazing. The tag records temperature, pressure, light, and time, and from that we can calculate position of the animal in the ocean. Call 3906. So we've got um, a hydrophone here, so it's listening for uh, sharks that have acoustic tags on them. So the acoustic tags are emitting these unique ping codes. And so when they swim within range of the boat, probably 200 to 500 yards or so, we can detect their presence on this device. Um, so we'll have a unique number for each shark that's det detected. And it's really nice, we have this little cheat sheet here that's telling us who we're seeing. So for instance, if I saw 43910, that's Kilimanjaro, um, which we tagged back in November of this season, um, which is a male, it tells us what length it is, whether or not we have a biopsy of the tag. Um, so it's really great information for when the sharks come by the boat. We're building a surveillance system in our neighborhood where we can actually pick up the animals as they swim by the buoys and an acoustic tag will send an underwater signal that's detected by the buoy. It goes up to an Iridium satellite and immediately down to our iPhone where we can actually keep track of which sharks are swimming by. 
When we're out at Año Nuevo, we're also taking biopsies, also called tissue samples, and water samples to sample for any white shark DNA shed into the environment. As sharks swim, they shed cells containing their DNA into the ocean. This environmental DNA is like a white shark's fingerprint. So we take the seawater samples back to the lab where we can use advanced genetic techniques to detect if a white shark has been in the area without needing a direct interaction with the animal. This is a map of processed eDNA samples from our study site on Nuevo Island. In the middle, this red triangle is our acoustic buoy where we listen for the sharks, and we've taken eDNA samples all around that. The green boxes correspond to eDNA samples that were positive for white sharks. The yellow samples are places where we sampled eDNA in conjunction with a tissue biopsy for our genomics work. Unlike collecting eDNA samples, which just requires a few bags of water, collecting tissue samples can be a lot more difficult. We need the shark right next to the boat in order to collect a tissue sample. In doing so, we get a lot more information about how diverse our population is. So we have had preliminary results from our genomic studies of the white sharks in Ananiwebo. And from that, we know that the genetic diversity is actually very low in this population, which means that there's fewer adults, mature adults, that, than we would like uh, in the white shark population. And that has implications because if we don't have a healthy pool of mature adults, then that population is not going to be very resilient to environmental pressures and changes and to population declines. The really great thing about white sharks is that we can uniquely identify them using their dorsal fins. Each dorsal fin is basically like, like a fingerprint. Uh, it has nicks and notches that allow us to uniquely identify the individuals. So when they swim by the boat, we have a GoPro underwater, we film them and we capture that dorsal fin. When we get back to the lab, we can crop that image, see that dorsal fin and then match it against the other dorsal fins seen that day so we can see how many individuals we've seen and even match those images to those uh, historically collected. Oh my god, Gigi's here! Woo! Gigi's back! So all of our sharks, we get to know. And if they've come back many, many times, we get to know them quite well. And one of my favorite sharks is Gigi. She's a big female, and she showed up one afternoon beneath the boat, and none of us knew she was there. And when we looked over the side and saw this large white shark, you know, at the time over 4,000 pounds, it really was stunning to see her. Mid-Med and Tim Tam were a match. Oh, yeah. Well, um, and that's why I was sad about Tim Tam not having his targeting. So we have here some of the fins from our season. Um, so I've gone and downloaded the video from the GoPros, cropped out the fins and printed them out to match them. So for instance, here we have Lawrence. Um, this is a shark we saw one of our last days of the season. So I got a blown up image of Lawrence's fin here. So we can look at some of the unique features to the fin. So for instance, this is really big notch here, but also some more subtle features. So there's this tiny little triangle here. We have this big notch down here. Uh, and we can use these features to match to both fins seen this season, but also historically from earlier years to see if we've seen Lawrence before or not. <laughs> to really understand the white sharks here in Monterey Bay, we also need to understand what their prey are doing. So the Block Lab, we're looking at the white shark movements here, but we have other collaborators at UC Santa Cruz and the University of Washington that can provide the expertise to understand the prey. The Monterey Bay White Shark Project is, a, is an outgrowth of an earlier program that we had here with Barbara Block and, and the Monterey Bay community, the Tagging Pacific Predators. Onion Wave was a great example of how our research moves forward. The shark team sits offshore in their boat and they follow the sharks. We work on the island and we put tags on the sea line, so it really is a land-sea interface. And the animals we work with then cross that area. And we really want to know when a sea lion leaves the beach, does it have a particular corridor that it goes through? Does it swim really fast until it gets further offshore? We know that elephant seals leave the beach and they immediately go down to the bottom and they hug the bottom as they go out to sea until they reach the continental shelf edge. So our major question with this research project is to see the relationship between where most of the sea lions and seals are and to see if that's what is driving the presence of the sharks. Do the white sharks track the major areas along the coast where we have the most sea lions and the most seals. But amazingly, we don't know that yet.
is one of the tags we use. It's a satellite linked uh, tracking device. It has a GPS tag that gives us very accurate locations. We use it on both northern elephant seals and California sea lions. And you can see really different patterns. The sea lions are staying close to shore, moving up and down California, some of them going down to Baja, and elephant seals go way out to sea. So for the shark program, we're really focusing on the sea lions because they stay coastal. The elephant seals are really only in uh, coming in contact with the sharks when they're migrating to and from Anya Nueva, which is really a, a relatively short period of time. The sea lions, on the other hand, are really moving up and down the coast and spending all of their time in the same areas where the sharks are. We use a variety of approaches to study these animals. One of them is just to observe them on the beach and the, the new development of technology in the forms of drones are making that a lot easier to actually measure their populations much more accurately than we can do by standing on the beach with binoculars. This is our DJI Matrice. We've equipped it with a special thermal imaging camera. The thermal imaging camera captures infrared imagery that identifies the heat signatures of specific seals and sea lions when we're flying it over them. One of the exciting things about this technology is that we can pre-program optimized routes using a map over the rookery. And so before even going out in the field, we know that we're gonna get full coverage of the rookery and we have really repeatable surveys that we can do every month. We're getting ready to fly one of our sites here, uh, Lobos Rock, which is at Agarapada State Park. And it's a pretty unique site in that it's offshore. Uh, and so historically, these are really tough sites to get at. Uh, you usually have to get them a boat or an airplane. Software uh, creates sort of a grid pattern there, a little survey grid that actually uploads a little onboard computer on the drone and it automates the whole process. So we actually use a Google Earth map, pull up the site, we draw a little survey uh, grid around it, say, okay, that's about the right size, it's at the right altitude so as not to disturb the sea lines. It gets uploaded into the drone, uh, we push go and the drone takes off on its own and heads on out to the site and surveys. And it usually takes about five to seven minutes or so. We use the drones for several pieces of critical information, one of them being to locate the animals and guide the boat towards the animals, um, and another being to provide measurements. So with the drones, we know that we're flying at a constant altitude, and uh, that number, altitude, can help us actually measure the animals. That's called photogrammetry. So we lay out a calibration board, and then we're able to provide a really uh, precise length measurement for these animals and understand whether they're juveniles, subadults, or adults. Another piece of information we collect from the drones is we do focal follows. So we will drop down altitude on the animal, we'll take video, and then we'll be able to extract information from that video using computer vision frameworks like tail beat frequency, speed, and then get a sense of fine scale kinematics. Over the past 30 years, we've done a tremendous job learning about where white sharks are along North American shores and building in protections that help preserve these populations. Once they migrate offshore, however, they're exposed to international fisheries. And we're thinking about what level of international protection is required to ensure these sharks have a future in our ecosystem in Monterey Bay.